السلام عليك زين الأنبياء السلام على الله أكبر 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 كبيرا والحمد لله كثيرا وسبحان الله بكرة وأصيلا لا إله إلا الله ولا نعبد إلا إياه مخلصين له دين ولو كره الكافرون لا إله إلا الله وحده نصر ونواز نصر عبده وصدق وعده ونصر عبد عز جنه وهزم الأحزاب وحده لا إله إلا الله والله أكبر ولله الحمد الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد المفتاح باب رحمة الله عدد ما في الملا صراة والسلام دائمين بدوام منك الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وشر أنه الله الذي لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إلها واحدا وربا شاهدا ونحن له مسلمون وشر أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وكرة عيننا محمد عبده ورسوله أرسله الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهر على الدين كله وركار المشركون أما بعد يا إبال الله إني مسيكم ونفس إياي بتقوى الله الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has blessed us to reach this blessed day of Eid and we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us all of our fasts all of our recitation all of our prayers all of our supplications all of the various actions and righteous deeds that we did in that blessed month of Ramadan and we ask him for an acceptance that is a means for us to receive the fruit of everything that it is that we've done throughout this year and inshallah that seeds were planted in this month that will continue to harvest in this year and in the upcoming years and in the barzakh and on the day of judgment and eternally into paradise and this is from the great bounty of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you can do something in time you can do something that in relation to how it is that you and I experience time, it's just a moment or a few moments or a very short period of time. But as a result, Allah places so much blessing in it, you harvest the fruits from it eternally. This is solely from His bounty, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on this day, I wanted to look at an in, a few insights into the blessed surah, Surah Al-Waqi'ah. The blessed chapter in the Quran about which that our Prophet ﷺ spoke and encouraged us to read. And one of our special guests had pointed out some of these meanings, but we wanted to go a little bit deeper with the intention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a reality within us. And as we transition out of Ramadan, that we have something that you and I can do consistently in a very practical way to keep us connected, to keep us connected to the Qur'an and keep us connected to the meaning of Ramadan. Because Ramadan has an outward form, but it has an internal reality and a meaning. And that is the meaning that you and I want it to carry over. The madrasa of Ramadan. That's supposed to have taught us how to be people of taqwa. And the internal dimension of this religion. And our piety and recognition internally that Allah sees us at all times. This is what we want to carry over outside the month of Ramadan. And one of the indications in Allah Ta'ala's book after the cluster of verses that deal with fasting, that deal with the month of Ramadan, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala then says, and this is a question that they asked the Prophet SallAllahu and the response was, Inni qareeb. فَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ anni ibadi fa'inni Qareeb. That when my servants ask about me, say, I am near, I am close. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي أَنِّي فَإِنِّي قريب. And when my servants ask about me, say, that I am near. And then we have the etiquettes that are mentioned after that of 
realizing that we are near to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and that He is near to us. But this is how our heart should be after the blessed month of fasting, is it is then predisposed to be able to be focused on the higher matters, the ma'ali al-umur, the higher affairs and the lofty matters that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But our Prophet sallallahu he gave us practical guidance in relation to Surah Al-Waqi'ah. And this translates as Al-Waqi'ah, the inevitable event. This is something that will transpire. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. And our Prophet taught us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مَنْ قَرَعَ سُرَةَ الْوَاقِعَةِ كُلَّ اللَّيْلَةِ لَمْ تُصِبْهُ فَاقَةٌ أَبَدًا Whoever recites the chapter Al-Waqi'ah, the 56th chapter of the Qur'an, the inevitable event, whoever recites this chapter every single night will never be in a position of need. Faqa is where you are in need of something, whether that be wealth, whether that be other people, whatever that might be. You'll never be in a position of need. You'll never, according to another translation, be in a position where you are impoverished in the true meaning of the word impoverished. And what is meant by that is, there are a number of meanings, but our Prophet also taught us in another hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that one of the names of Surat Al-Waqa is Surat Al-Ghina. This is the chapter of sufficiency, the chapter of abundance. And so in different narrations, because faqa is juxtaposed to ghina. Ghina, generally speaking, is translated as riches, as wealth, things of this nature. But here it relates to our needs. The chapter of ghina. This is the chapter of abundance. This is the chapter of sufficiency. In other words, is that there's something about this blessed chapter of the Quran when we read it and when we understand it meaning, its meanings, that it transforms us. It prepares us to be in a state whereby which we will only feel that we're in need of Allah wa ta'ala. And the end of that hadith that was that last quoted, فَقْرَأُوهَا So recite it. وَعَلِّمُوهَا أَوْلَادُكُمْ And teach your children this chapter. Teach it to your children. And so we have a blessed story in the life of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the great companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And towards the end of his life, he became ill. And it happened to be the illness in which that he returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And while he was sick, as it is sunnah to do, he was visited by the great caliph of Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan. And he said to him, Ma that what are you suffering from? And he said, the Nubi. So outwardly he was very sick. But look at the perspective of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What are you suffering from? And he said, my own sins. He was outwardly sick. He was ill. But this was their perspective. Is that this was the true sickness. Is to meet Allah and to have in your heart diseases of the heart or to have sins that have yet to be forgiven. And this is Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. If you're going to say anyone's going to be from the people of paradise, it would have been him and those that were like him from those that were close to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa But he's teaching us how we should be. So then Sayyidina Uthman said to him, فَمَا تَشْتِهِ Is that, what do you desire? And he said, رَحْمَةُ Rabbi. I desire the mercy of my Lord. And we hope this is our state. Whatever it is that we are going through as we approach that ultimate moment of truth when we will meet our Lord, we hope that we're in the best of states. We hope that we're in a state that we are longing to meet Allah, hoping for His mercy, yet fearing our sins and all of the things that we've done. And that is a sign of true belief and no one will meet Allah in that state save that Allah Ta'ala will receive him in the very best of ways and surely forgive all of his or her sins. And so then Sayyidina Uthman said, tabib. Shall I not bring you a physician? And look at his response. Al-Tabib amradani. The physician is the one who made me ill in the first place. He saw it as being from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is there any financial assistance that I can give you? 
قال لا حاجة لي فيه. He says, I have no need of this. Look at the way he's thinking. This is a man that is preparing to meet his Lord. And the meanings of faith, the meanings of iman, have been fixated in that blessed heart of his. He says that I have no need for any of that. But you can save what I'm going to give you for your female, your daughters after you. Save it for your family. Let leave it behind for them so they can inherit you. And then he said to him, الفقر? He's speaking to Sayyidina Uthman. And Sayyidina Uthman knows, but he's everyone is doing their job and what they're supposed to be doing. And then he says, so Abdullah bin Mas'ud says to Uthman, do you fear poverty for my daughters? And he says, I have told my daughters, I have taught them to recite every single night Surah Al-Waqi'ah. Look at these people's iman. He says, I have taught my daughters every single night to recite Surah Al-Waqi'ah. And indeed that I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, Man qara' Surah Al-Waqi'ah kulla laylatan lam tusibhu faqah. And anyone who recites Surah Al-Waqi'ah every single night will never be in a position of need. They will never be afflicted with poverty. These were people that had absolute certainty in the words of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said something to them, they believed it wholeheartedly. They believed it with absolute conviction. And they were people that took it with strength. Ya Yahya Khudul Kitabi bi And that directing the address to the Prophet John the Baptist. Oh Yahya, take the book bi Take it with strength. Take it with high aspiration. When you hear something of benefit, don't let it just come in one ear and out the other. Whether you are young or old, make an intention that everything of benefit that you hear, that you're going to live by that that you're going to put it into practice and that you're going to act upon it even once. And Imam Anawi says this and it's a beautiful faida, a beautiful point. He says, any time that you hear of any type of meritorious act of any sort, he said, try to do it at least once, at least once. So on the day of judgment, when people are raised that people that did that particular blessed invocation or that particular prayer or that particular act of goodness, you will be erased from among them. And so what is it then about this blessed chapter of the Quran that is a means for us to maintain and attain sufficiency, to not be in a state of need, which is again something that our Prophet وسلم, taught us to ask for Allah minayasulakul huda. O oh Allah, I ask you for guidance, what tuqa, and for piety, wal afaf, clemency, restraint, wal ghina, and sufficiency. And people should not think here that our Prophet ﷺ was asking for wealth. As we will see in the commentary of the scholars upon these ahadith, is that our Prophet had a much, much loftier virtue in, virtue in mind when you talk about the meaning of ghina, abundance. And really what this is saying here is that if Allah Taala protects us from faqa, from being in need, and grants us the state of sufficiency, ghina, it's so that we are not put in a position where we are in need of people. We're not put in a position then where we will do something that is undesirable or blameworthy because we're in need of people. And even beyond that, it has an even deeper meaning. Is it not only so that we can be safe from these various vices that come from this state, but it's also so that we can strengthen our state of yaqeen, of certitude. And this is what some of the arifin, the knowers of Allah Ta'ala have said about why our Prophet encouraged us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to recite this chapter so often, lead ten miyatil yaqeen. To that cultivate in our hearts utmost certitude in belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is accompanied by sukoon al qalb, where your heart then becomes tranquil and literally is that it is at rest. 
you are tranquil, your heart is at rest. Whether you have a lot of provision or whether Allah Ta'ala that holds back from you, your heart is at rest. And then what remains is that we look at the meanings of this blessed chapter so we can see exactly what it contains and how it teaches us these meanings of certitude, how it teaches us what it is that you and I should focus on as believers. So that if we look at Surah Al-Waqi'ah, it begins by saying, إِذَا وَقَعَتِ الْوَاقِعَةِ When the inevitable event takes place, and this is in relation to the Qiyamah, the standing, the Day of Judgment. And Allah Ta'ala uses here a verb that is in the past tense. But the rhetorical meaning of that is, it's so imminent, it's as if it's already happened. إِذَا وَقَعَتِ الْوَاقِعَةِ And so that, yes, we might translate this as when, but it literally means it has happened. And it is so close, it is as if it has already happened. لَيْسَ لِوَقْعَتِهَا كَاذِبًا Then no one can deny it has come. خَافِرَةٌ رَافِعَةٌ It will debase some and elevate others. Based upon how you and I lived here in this world, what we believed or what we did not believe, what we did or what we did not do, will depend upon what transpired, that what happens here in this world will dictate what happens in the next. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about some of the realities of what's going to happen in the way that the world and the universe, that in the cosmos that we're in, start to change. إِذَا رُجَّتِ الْأَرْضُ When the earth will be violently shaken. وَبُسَّتِ الْجِبَالُ بَسَّ And the mountains will be crushed to pieces. فَكَانَتْ هَبَاءً مُنْبَثَّ Becoming scattered particles of dust. وَكُنْتُمْ أَزْوَاجٍ ثَلَاثَ And you will all be divided into three groups. So the first meaning here is, and this is what the scholars point out, is that to the extent that we focus upon these realities, i.e. the realities of the hereafter, this should be at the very forefront of our mind. This should be at the forefront of how it is that you and I practice this religion. And the more that we focus on the hereafter, the more that our affairs of this world will be in order, ironically. It seems like the more that you give to the world, your worldly affairs, that the better the state will be. But it's actually the opposite. The more that we place our focus on the hereafter, the more that Allah Ta'ala will arrange all of our affairs for us in this world. And no greater example of that is our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who reached the highest degree of trust in Allah. He would give out all of his personal wealth every single day. Yes, there was times where he would leave a certain amount of provision with his family, with certain family members of his, but that was for them. And that was to legislate the permissibility of that for his ummah, for his, for his nation. But in and of himself, he would not sleep at night with anything. He would give away all of his extra wealth. So that he could be completely in a state of trust in Allah Taala, And that, of course, did not mean that he always had a lavish amount of provision that we know he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, will go sometimes two entire months on the Eswadain, dates and water, other than what might have been sent his way by a neighbor. And this is the best of creation. And despite all of that, Allah Taala preserved the nadara of his blessed body, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is that us, if that if we go without food for a long period of time, we start to get scrawny and skinny and unbecoming. But our Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whether he ate a little, he never ate a lot, so you can't say a lot. Whether he ate a little or a little bit more, is that Allah always preserved his beautiful body, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He had the most beautiful physical body and the most beautiful physical characteristics of all, let alone the characteristics of his uh, of his character let alone the characteristics and the nature of his internal being sallallahu alaihi that it would overwhelm anyone that would gaze upon that reality sallallahu alaihi but by teaching us here in this chapter to focus upon the hereafter and to accept what is inevitable 
This is going to happen. Al waqia waqa literally is to happen. But this is the greatest of all happenings. This is the day of judgment that is being referred to here. And when you and I come to recognize that we are returning to Him, it positions us in a way so that we can then benefit from the little provision that we should be receiving and taking from this world. And then after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention three categories of people. The people of the right, the people of the left, and then the highest degree of all, which are the sabiqun. That Allah Ta'ala says about them that they are the muqarrabun, that they are the ones who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then if we think about this, and for the world that is going to come, which is, is this true travel, the travel to the hereafter, the voyage to the next world. When we think about provision, have we ever even thought about the provision that we'll need there? We don't think about that because we assume that it's going to be taken care of. So if we assume the provision of the hereafter is going to be taken care of, and everything that we hear that Allah Ta'ala will give the muqarrabun and give the people that are close to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, why do we not then assume that he won't take care of our provision here? Think about the hereafter. We're going to live eternally. Are, has anyone ever, has any one of us ever worried about not having enough provision in the hereafter? We know Allah is going to provide for us. He tells us what he's going to give. And what everyone's going to experience, he's going to provide for us then eternally. Is not the one who will provide for us then? Is not the one who created us to begin with then going to be the one who's going to provide for us here? And so after these clusters of verses that deal with these three groups of people, then our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he says, awa'aba'akum al-awwalun. And that now he's going to then that speak about those who deny this truth and deny the message of the Prophet ﷺ and the Quran. And that unfortunately, that have misconceptions that get in the way of their belief. And so he says that in our forefathers as well, that in then, قُلْ إِنَّ الْأَوَّلِينَ Say, O Prophet, most certainly early and later generations, will all be gathered together for the appointed day. Everyone will be gathered together on the appointed day. And here is where now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to start mentioning that some of the things in his creation subhanahu wa ta'ala that should cause us to reflect. Think very deeply about these things around us and how they are happening. And this is there to strengthen our certitude. And that the one who caused these things to happen will surely take care of us. Because we will see that when people's response is to the provision that we are given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we then deny the truth of this message, this is the worst thing that could happen of all. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes on to say, Afara'itum ma noon in verse number 58. Have you considered the semen you eject? Tumnun. This is a relation that to the human being, the male, and what emits from him in a particular act. Is it you who create a child out of it? Or is it we who do so? Think about the amazing nature of how children are born. What did you and I do in relation to that process? There's means that relate to that, of course. And Allah Ta'ala has made that lawful and beautiful when we do it for His sake, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are not at war with the flesh. But this is a sign from Allah. Think about the amazing nature of that. And everything that we now know about this whole process and all of the details and that everything that is happening at the microscopic level, what did we really do other than take the means in a very small way outwardly? But then out of that comes a child. Are we the ones that created it? Or are we the ones that created it? The royal we. Allah Taala. He's the one who creates. So the very first thing that he reminds us of, and keep in mind, this is Surah Al-Ghina. This is the chapter of affluence. 
Allah is reminding us in relation to our own existence. Where did we come from? The very fact that we exist and that there was a time where no one even knew about us. No one ever even knew about us. And then we're here. And there will come a time soon where the vast majority of people forget us. But we're here. How do we get here? The amazing nature of khalq, of creation. How could you witness that? And know what is transpiring and when the egg is fertilized and then a child starts to grow and is about nine months in the womb of his mother and then enters into this world. How on earth could someone deny the existence of God when you're aware of that? Only a kafir would deny the existence of God after seeing that. That is the epitome of what it means to disbelieve. When you put that aside as if that didn't happen, as if that came together by itself, as if that happened because of that some type of random mutation or from some process that is termed natural selection or whatever. That is utterly absurd and ridiculous. These are signs that indicate the Khaliq, the creator of the heavens and the earth, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so in relation to our own existence, what did we have to do with our existence? Allah brought us into existence. What do we have to do with the process of how we came into existence? And so if Allah provided for us in that way and brought us into existence and that caused us to have parents to take care of us while it is that we are young such that we lived into an age of maturity to the point where now that we can think about what is transpiring in life, is he not the one who's also going to provide for us? So why is there a disconnect this is why this is here. This is tanmi to the yaqeen. If we reflect deeply upon these meanings in Allah Ta'ala's book, it will build certainty in our heart. If every time we read that, whether we're reading in the Arabic or we're re reading in translation or both, it should fill our heart with certainty. And then Allah Ta'ala goes on to say, أَفَرَأَيْتُمْ مَا تَحْرُثُونَ Have you considered what you sow? The seeds that you plant in the earth because you want to grow something. Allah then says, Is it you who cause it to grow or is it we who do so? Think about the process of growing anything. And look at what Allah Ta'ala is mentioning here. He first starts with our existence. Our own existence itself is entirely dependent upon Allah. But then think how we are in need of plants and everything in the plant kingdom. Not just for our food, but for our clothing. Think about all the benefits of plants. All of the remedies and medicines that come from plants. And all of the blessings that come from things that grow on earth. Think about the blessings that are therein. And think about that whole process. How you could have a seed. And what exists within that seed such that an apple seed is different than a cherry seed, which is different than this seed is different than that seed. But if you plant it and you plant it in the right way and just take the basic means and know a little bit about what to do, it grows into a tree and ultimately bears fruit or whatever plant that it is that you are planting, whether it is cotton or whatever else it is. This is something that is amazing. What did we have to do with this process? And Allah reminds us, If we willed, we could simply reduce this harvest to chaff, leaving you to lament. You could have certain weather conditions, or you could have some type of insect or whatever takes place, such as those various seeds that you planted, you don't get to benefit from the fruit. You don't get to benefit from what it is, that you, the work that you've done. Think about this in relation to that human creation, in relation to that everything that we plant. But then Allah Ta'ala goes on to mention two more things as well. And all of these things relate to the necessities of life. Then he says, <laughs> Have you considered the water you drink? <laughs> Is it you who bring it down from the clouds? Or is it we who do so? And be careful of these demonic, dajjalic, pharaonic type people that are talking about now that 
putting things into the atmosphere so that it can then rain. And that somehow that they think that they can think that they are in control. And the closer and closer that we get to the end of time, the wars they say of this century, may there not be any of them, but they say will be over resources. And towards the end of time is that the resources will be in the hands of a few. And a few will then hand that over ultimately to the Messiah Dajjal, to the Antichrist who comes at the end of time, where he will have access to the world's resources. But the believers will be sufficed with different meanings. They will be sufficed with the meanings of faith. They will be sufficed with the meanings of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the closer and closer that we get to the end of time, and if someone doesn't think that we're living in their time, I don't know what world you are living in. We need to read the signs that our Prophet told us about over 1400 years about the end of time so that you and I can protect ourselves and prepare for events that we know that we're going to are transpire in this world before we even return to Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. But Allah Ta'ala is saying here is that He is the one who descends the rain. He is the one who sends it down. Tabarak wa Ta'ala. Lo ujajin. Were we to have willed, we could have made it salty. What is the sunnah dua that we're supposed to say when we drink water? Alhamdulillah, ja'alu adhban faratan bi rahmatih. All praise be to the one who made it sweet and pleasant through his mercy. And he did not make it salty and bitter through our sins. Allah made us have sweet, pleasant water to drink. What a blessing. And think about how much we need water. We made everything have life out of water. Without water, without plants, what kind of life would there be? And then the last thing that Allah Ta'ala mentions is, Have you considered the fire you kindle? Is it you who produces its trees, or is it we who do so? So, human creation, plants of all sorts, water, and then fire. Think about our need of fire and of warmth in general, and then everything that we do with fire, and how fire is used for things that then we turn into building materials. Fire is used then for preparing our various food items and so many other things. Think about the uses of fire and all of these natural elements that are absolutely necessary for human life. Allah is causing us, wants us to reflect on these realities. He's the one who created us. He's the one who, that gave us plants. He is the one who gave us water. He is the one who gave us fire. And he's the one who causes all of these things to happen when we take the means. Should we not be people then to turn to him? Should we have any worry then about our provision? Should we have any worry then about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking care of us here in this world? And this is what ends up happening because our Prophet did tell us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in yukuna kufra, is that poverty is almost on the verge of being disbelief because what happens when people don't have enough and the decisions that they then make but then Allah Taala says <laughs> is that we have made it as a reminder and a provision for the travelers <laughs> this should be our response to all of these manifestations not just oh Subhanallah, we shouldn't be in a state of awe at the wonder of creation. Don't let people's understanding of my modern science that take from you the natural awe that even children have and every even, even the most intelligent adult human being should have when we're looking at creation. We should be in awe. Just because we understand the means does not mean that we shouldn't be in awe. In fact, we should even be in more awe. The more we know about the amazing nature of the universe, and its expanses and how that fine-tuned it really is, the more we should be in awe of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بُوَاكَ النَّجُومِ If that's not enough, he swears by the positionings of the stars and how amazing that is and how that they rise and they set in the exact same place at the exact same time at every time of the year and the distances, the intergalactic distances between them yet they appear in the canopy of heaven in a particular way. And some of them also say this reply, relates to 
the verses in his book, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single one of them is perfectly placed. But if you don't know astronomy, you'll go out and just see there's a bunch of dots that are flashing in the sky. But if you know, you know that, oh, this is the season, and this is this such and such constellation, and kada wa kada. And likewise, the people of knowledge know Allah's book. And Imam al Zari has a book called Al Dhabir al Breeze, pure gold, fi khawas al kitab al Aziz. About the that special properties of the various fiqhwas ayat al kitab al aziz of the various verses of the mighty book of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Wa innu lo qasm la qasm lo taalamun al adim. Indeed, this is a great that this is a great oath. If indeed you know, and then in closing, what happens to someone when they deny this reality? Allah taala then addresses. Those who deny these realities, and he says, that do you how can you take this message lightly? How can you take this message lightly? And what do you do in response to this? Is that that you that repay Allah for your provisions with denial? You repay Allah for your provisions with denial, your life, all of those blessings that he gave you. And then that we deny these realities. And either by not believing in him, or that even if you've been granted belief, through weak belief, putting into question where Allah Ta'ala has placed you, or what it is that he has given you. And then to show our need of him, to show our need of him in a conclusive way. There's no doubt about this. He reminds us of the end of our lives. Then he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that why then are you helpless when the soul of a dying person reaches their throat? Why then are you helpless when the soul of a dying person reaches their throat? Is that while you that, that while you are looking on? Is that return it if that you are truthful? Bring your soul back. Now if you are so that that one sorry uh وَأَنْتُمْ حِينَ إِذَنْ تَنْظُرُونَ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْكُمْ وَلَكِنْ لَا تُبْصِرُونَ Is that, why then are you helpless when the soul of a dying person reaches their throat? While you are looking on. And we are nearer to such a person than you, but you, could, but you cannot see. فَلَوْ لَا that إِنْ كُنْتُمْ غَيْرَ مَدِينِينَ Now if you are not subject to our will as you claim, تَجْعُونَ هَنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Bring that soul back if what you say is true. Tajiruna. When the soul reaches the throat, what kind of state will we be in? How we will know our absolute need of our Lord. But at that point, it's too late. If the soul reaches here and we haven't made the right decision, there's nothing it is that we can do. Think about how we'll be forced into a position of humility. So why then do we transgress on the earth when we're in a state where... It, has not, it hasn't reached that state yet. These are reminders for all of us so that you and I can live in the right way and live in a way that is pleasing to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah ta'ala give us tawfiq to have the utmost certainty in these realities and to that know with absolute conviction that our provision is from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to do what is pleasing to him in all of our different states. So, qulu qulu hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li jimi muslimi fa astaghfiru fa nughfur rahim. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Admin, wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad, and Ashraf and Bayah al Musaneen, wa ala Ali Tayyibin, and Tahirin, wa sahabi al Muhdadin, wa tabi umbil Hassani al Lumidin, wa alayna ma'amufin, barahmati yar hamarahameen, a shalom la ilaha illallah, wa shalom la muhammad rasulullah, amma ba'ad, ya ibad Allah, ni musikum, wa nafsi iyaya, bi taqwa Allah. In closing, as we reflect upon these great meanings of the Qur'an, 
we should tie them to what the month that just passed us. In this month, is that we had a special relationship to Allah Ta'ala's provision that He gives us as human beings. And we that intentionally and consciously abstained from what was normally permissible from dawn until sunset. Teaching us that what we are actually truly in need of, even though Allah has made us in need of certain things outwardly, our greatest need of all internally is our need of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in suspending our connection with these things outwardly for an extended period of time during the day, it teaches us that it is possible in our hearts for us to rely solely upon him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to that interact with the world that Allah Ta'ala has given us in a way that we are not fully immersed in the means such that we forget him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that we want to carry over into the months after Ramadan, where insha'Allah ta'ala is that the meanings of the fast and the meanings of seeking our provision through him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, grow strong in our hearts. And this is what we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. And may we be from people who attain the highest degree of certitude and who that then as a result of that certitude have a number and a multiple manifestation of good deeds that we do that are pleasing to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us on this day of Eid and that we should not forget the blessed sunnahs of this day is that one of the forgotten sunnahs is, is that you're supposed to go home a different way than it is that you came. And there's a number of wisdoms in doing so, but so that there could be more places that testify according to some that you worshipped him in that particular area. And we should also remember to make sure to pay our zakat al-fitr is that our fasts are suspended in between heaven and earth until we pay zakat al-fitr. And according to some ulama that it's makru, it's disliked to delay that till after the Eid prayer. But it's haram to do it till past sunset of the day of Eid. And so inshallah we'll make sure to take care of our zakat al-fitr. And this is a day of festivity. This is a day that we should greet the believers. And this is a day that inshallah ta'ala we should have joy for his sake. May Allah ta'ala accept from all of us Give us tawfiq in all of our fears. Eid Mubarak to all of you. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayu alladhina amanu sallu alihi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala sayyidu Muhammad wa ala alihi sayyidu Muhammad. Kama salli ta'ala sayyidu Ibrahim wa ala alihi sayyidu Muhammad. Inna ka hamidu majib wa baraka ala sayyidu Muhammad wa ala alihi sayyidu Muhammad. Kama baraka ta'ala sayyidu Ibrahim wa ala alihi sayyidu Ibrahim. Fir alamina. Inna ka hamidu majib wa radiyallahu ta'ala an sadat al khulufa rashidin. Abi Bakr wa umatwan wa ali wa ala hasim رسول الله المطهرين مع جاس وعلينا مع مفين برحمتك يا رحم الرحمين اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم نوات آواكم الله نصركم الله إن الله يعمر بالعدل وإحسان ويتايد الكربة وينهاء الفحشاء والمكر البغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروا نعم يزيدكم على نعم يزيدكم ولا ذكر الله أكبر Thank you for watching one of المقاصد's online educational offerings our mission at Al-Maqasid is to cultivate holistic learning environments rooted in knowledge, devotion, and service. For more information, please visit our website at almaqasid.org and connect with other online content at almaqasid.org slash connect.